I expect some pretty strong um, price growth in, in a lot of different crypto assets. I just don't necessarily know what will happen when the crash comes. Probably it will come down pretty hard uh, as well. Uh, so that's kind of my my sort of working hypothesis at the moment. All right, hi everyone. It's Darren Wilson here. I'm joined by uh, Akil Patel. Uh, good morning, Akil. Good morning. So we're just doing a um, quick Q and A follow up from the uh, Boom Bus Bulletin webinar that was held on the. 26th of July, which was um, last Monday. We got a number of very, very interesting questions um, during that chat. And we did say that we would collate them and actually produce a uh, follow-up video so that we can actually go in more detail and answer those. So without further ado, I'm going to be reading the questions to Akil, and then hopefully we'll be able to give you the answers that you're looking to hear. All right, so our first question for a kill. I'm set up with 65% cash presently. Um, at what point do you think I should start entering the equity market? So good question. This is really about market timing. So in the roadmap that we produced for 2021, we talked about a potential turning point uh, sometime this year, uh, maybe an important low. Uh, this would have been apparent to all of our PSE subscribers. Um, so I think this year is a good year to be starting to put money into sort of um, in the equity markets. I don't know if he's looking at ETFs or he's talking more generally or looking at particular stocks. Um, so it's a bit hard for me to be too specific, but essentially the bigger picture is we're expecting the you know a bull run in equities for the next four to five years doesn't mean, of course, that uh, stocks will go up in a straight line. Um, there will be some ups and downs in the markets. So and I, but I think it's the point uh, is that if you have that sort of time horizon, you know, if you enter the market and it goes down a few percent, um, that's in the long term, not really uh, sort of a big deal. I mean, the second point I'd make is, of course, um, we at PSE very much advocate uh investing in stocks that are trending up. So they're making a series of higher highs and higher lows uh, in an uptrend. Uh, and so if you are looking at certain stocks or funds that are doing that, then those are funds that you should be buying. So my view is, yeah, no, I mean, greater equity exposure uh, is a good thing at this point in the time. Yeah, I do recall you did list, the, I think it was half a dozen particular sectors during the webinar that um, uh, uh, should be um, trending very, very well with the second half of the cycle. Um, so, you know, that's um, once that video is available, of course, that um, that member can go back and have a look at those sectors as well to decide. Yeah, sure. I mean, just to reiterate for those who haven't um, who haven't watched the webinar, um, those stocks are. Uh, sectors in uh, position well for the second half of the real estate cycle. So construction, infrastructure, house building, kind of property related finance, because particularly banks and other financing houses uh, are involved in lending uh, for real estate. Uh, certain types of technology. Um, I mean, technology in general is going to be a big theme, particularly as we uh, kind of move into this post pandemic world with a lot more remote working and so on. But in particular, technology related to um the buying and selling of land and financing and so on. Uh, and then also defense and aerospace and that kind of uh, play as well, because that's becoming quite a big theme, whether it's, um, you know, defense in a more traditional sense of, of building kind of uh, things for fighting wars, um, if we want to go ahead and put it that way. Also more kind of cyber security, which is a very big theme. Uh, and also, um, some defense stocks are really kind of aerospace stocks. And uh, in relation to that, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of interest in the near earth economy, uh, which sometimes come under the label of defense stocks. Excellent, thank you. Two questions next, Akil, they're both about crypto. So I can sum them up by basically saying, what are your views on uh, cryptos in general? 
both how do they fit into the cycle and what do you expect them to do at the peak? Interesting questions. Um, I mean, obviously, this is the first real estate cycle where cryptocurrency has been uh, something that people can invest in. So, so, you know, I suppose the easy answer is to say we'll have to wait and see. Um, but what our study of history shows us is that each cycle, there is always some new investment vehicle that people pour money into, particularly younger investors. Um, and uh, it's one of the reasons why the real estate cycle each time goes over the top. Uh, and I suspect that cryptocurrencies uh, will be that vehicle or one of the vehicles for that sort of process to happen again. So, so probably, um, you know, the next few years will be quite a good time to be investing in a portfolio of cryptocurrency assets. I think you need to be a bit selective in, in terms of what you're investing in. So, I mean, there's some real kind of scammy uh, coins that you can purchase. And even if they do go up sort of a thousand percent in three or four weeks, uh, they can equally come down by that amount in the following three to four weeks. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, use leverage carefully, because I know you can now sometimes buy Bitcoin on margin and so on. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, I think cryptocurrencies will ride up the second half of the cycle. Um, whether they're kind of a, an early advance warning of a peak, I don't know. I mean, I think that will that remains to be seen. Now, there's some been some suggestion also that maybe Bitcoin might play the role that gold has played uh, in previous cycles. Um, Theoretically, as an inflation hedge, though I'm not really sure gold is really an inflation hedge. Um, but, you know, maybe Bitcoin has that role. Maybe if it looks like there's a financial crisis coming, gold sometimes um, has some sort of appreciation uh, as it did after 2008 and the global financial crisis. So, so maybe Bitcoin and some other larger cryptocurrencies might have that role this time around. But, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, so the, the main thing is, I think it will be a good few years in cryptocurrency if you are selective in terms of what you buy. Yeah, I'm hearing there's um, potentially Bitcoin backed ETFs on the near horizon as well. So wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. You just have to be careful when you invest in funds. I really read the small print as to what they're actually invested in. You know, do they have the Bitcoin or whatever? And how's that stored and all that kind of stuff, custodial rights, et cetera, et cetera, separation and, and other things. Good, good. Now that's great, Akil. Uh, we've got a gold question uh, next. How does gold fit into the real estate cycle? I've been watching the movement of gold and it appears that it's in a bull market at the moment. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. So there was a peak in, in 2007, sorry, August the 7th, August the 10th, uh, 2020 um gold has come down it's put in a series of lower highs since then uh, if you're looking on a monthly time frame I, even then it's probably not quite in a bull market but selling on a weekly or daily it's not um so so i think that's the first point just to make so just question if it's really in a bull market uh the second point i'd make in you know again PSE subscribers will have seen some of our gold forecasts are expecting a low in gold um, later this year or, or sometime next year. Um, I think the point to make in relation to the real estate cycle is that gold behaves like other commodities and other commodities in general go up through the second half of the real estate cycle. And I believe that will be um, that will be the case this time. Um, I question whether it's really an inflation hedge. Uh, certainly not during the second half of the cycle. It just goes up with other commodities and commodity prices going up is a driver of inflation. So people will say, well, gold is going up, so it's an inflation edge. There's, it's not, I don't think it's quite that straightforward. It is true to say, though, that when you do get a financial crisis um, and some kind of panic, um, gold does tend to get quite a lot of buying pressure. And so prices do go up. And so it's an option for... Uh, the period after the peak of the cycle. Yeah, definitely. Um, and again, you know, your your goal report, both um, previous forecasts, 
uh, have been very accurate and moving forward as well. You've, I think you've done it out to 2026, your long-term uh, goal uh, Commodities, yeah, yeah. We don't have much gold history, so it's a bit hard to, to kind of produce the analysis in the same way. But for general, for commodities, yeah, it should peak later this decade after having a pretty strong run during the 2020s. This, this next question is very interesting because I know in the office, or in our case, the virtual office, we've actually been having a lot of talk about this. I'll, I'll read it to you. How do you see interest rates and inflation progressing during the second half of the cycle and the subsequent crash? Uh, what are the implications for those borrowing to invest trying to take advantage of the boom? Um. Yeah, this is a good question. So in general, I just answer the last bit first. Uh, in terms of borrowing, I mean, clearly there's a role for leverage in in kind of investing. Um, if you in the earlier in the cycle you invest, the better, because obviously asset prices will go up. And if you're using leverage, then your leverage ratio will go down because you're you've um, you know you've borrowed the same amount and your assets are going up. So, so the earlier you do it, the better. Um, now, I suppose the question is in part, do you, you know, if you've borrowed money, will you be paying higher rates of interest if interest rates are going to go up? I'm not convinced that interest rates will go up particularly quickly, um, partly because uh, the Federal Reserve has effectively changed its inflation targeting regime. It used to say that it's targeting 2%. Uh, and seem to be quite keen to raise interest rates as soon as you got to inflation at 2%. I think we're now targeting an average of 2%. And since interest rates, sorry, inflation has been a lot lower than 2% for a long time, that means there's the potential for inflation to go a lot higher than 2%, or not a lot, a bit higher than 2% for an extended period of time before they consider raising rates. So you will, you might have more of a divergence between inflation and interest rates. Um, going forward, which, you know, again, if you're borrowing at low rates of interest, that's not a bad thing. Um, now, what will happen to inflation? Each second half of real estate cycle involves higher inflation than the first. And in general, I mean, it's not entirely true every single cycle, but in general, involves higher rates of inflation in the second half. And given that we had pretty low inflation the first half, I certainly think that's, you know, that's got to be true. And we're st starting to see signs of it. Um, I don't think inflation will get extremely high because there are some deflationary forces, not least related to technology and also related to the huge amounts of borrowing that a lot of private companies and, um, you know, have done over the last uh, number of years. And so those are deflationary forces. But on the other hand, you know, we do have a lot of money being pumped into the global economy uh, by the public sector. There will be a lot of money pumped into the global economy by the private sector. When banks lend, they print money effectively to, to, to create those loans. Um, while I do think there's an enormous amount of capacity in the global economy to absorb that money, you know, it clearly the potential for it going way over the top, and that will create inflation. And so I think we're going to see higher rates of inflation over the next few years, maybe not hyperinflation as some people are suggesting um that doesn't necessarily mean that interest rates will rise quickly um but at some point towards the end of the real estate cycle uh they will have to raise interest rates the peak of the cycle always arises um in a rising interest rate environment and i think you can kind of see that happening so they don't do anything about interest rates for for, for an extended period of time and then suddenly think we really need to need to raise rates to try and bring inflation down. Of course, that will be too late because you'll have had the land boom. Um, and the other, I think the other point that Phil and I and you were talking about this the other day, um, you know, Chinese savings was blamed to a certain extent on low interest rates in the previous cycle. Uh, and Chinese, you know, savings and what, by what, by which we mean China, Chinese uh, citizens wanting to invest in Western assets, you know, huge amounts of money that they are looking for a home, uh, and you know Wall Street and the City of London and you know your Australian, Australian financial sector are really eyeing up opportunities, and so all of that money coming into Western assets will keep yields and interest rates low uh, for extending period of time. So that kind of supports the thesis that I've just outlined. Yeah, it's interesting. You, um, U.S. Fed Chair 
Jerome Powell is still sticking to the transitory inflationary speech, but that's not really being played out in the US bond market because bond yields, you know, continue to, to fall. Um, so there seems to be this, this real tug of war between the, um, the uh, forward guidance from the US Fed, the way that they're speaking about inflation and actually how the bond market is viewing it in terms of its pricing. So it's going to well, be- Well, um, yields are falling uh, and there is inflation, uh, and this relates previous to the previous question about gold. If, if, if yields are falling and if there is inflation, then you're getting negative yields in uh, real terms. Uh, and so that effectively will be very good for gold. Um, it could also mean that the bond market is sort of suggesting that actually for the moment there'll be in the, the headline rates of inflation will come down, um, you know, because, you know, clearly when you have things opening up all at once against a situation where, you know, maybe businesses are, you know, not at full speed as they were pre pandemic, there is an element of uh, inflation because you have a lot of demand chasing somewhat limited supply but the market does respond to that sort of thing so if there is more demand then you know in a proper market system then there will be more supply and so you'd expect then inflation to come down and it seems that there is that element in recent um in recent weeks in the bond market or it could just be that people aren't paying attention to the right things i i, I think this year is a bit funny it's just because you know we're sort of some of us are in lockdown some of us are not um you know, there's a lot of uh, public sector money that's been put into the global economy. Some of those schemes are ending uh, later this year. Some might be continued if, you know, the Delta variant takes hold. The U.S. is potentially going to pass an infrastructure plan that will start to roll out. So there's a lot of different uncertainties, I think, and, and markets are maybe not yet convinced as to which way things will go. Um and so I think this will be this will be quite interesting. But the broader picture is probably one that I've outlined. So there'll be there will be inflation. Um, you know, it always happens during a land boom. Interest rates may stay low for quite some time because there's the policy space to do that because of you know factors like Chinese uh, demand for wealth products. Um, but towards the end of the cycle, uh, there's always uh, a bit of a panic. Rates are raised very quickly, investors then pull out of the markets um, uh, and that kind of brings about the peak. Yeah, it's, um, I'm, I do apologize for the length of the answer, of course, but the bottom line is it's an extremely interesting question at this particular juncture of the, of the cycle. So I think, uh, I think you did very, very well to, to answer that, Akil. Um, on to the next question. So this one's about um, moving uh, assets, so I assume, you know, maybe hard assets or property assets, moving them to cash close to the peak, does that make sense? And does this mean disposing of property assets rather than refinancing to capitalise on capital growth and cheap credit? Um, I, we sort of touched on this in the webinar in the sense that um, if you're talking about real estate, I mean, you know, there's not necessarily the um, needs to sell even at the peak because if it's good quality real estate in a good location, you know, we all need to live somewhere and, you know, there'll be demand for someone to rent it and all that sort of thing. So actually maybe don't sell real estate at all. If we're talking about stocks, um, you know, potentially you could go into cash, potentially you could a hedge, um, you know, using a derivative contract of some description, um, you know, or use stop losses. Uh, and also on top of all of that, there is some tax considerations. So if you realize again, you might have to pay a tax and all that sort of thing. So I, I think, you know, it, it really depends on your financial circumstances. I don't think you necessarily need to overreact to the peak of the cycle. I mean, you know that stock prices should come down pretty hard. Um, um, but, you know, there are ways of managing that. Um, I think... If, if it were me personally, I would look to trim less quality assets out of my portfolio. So dispose of some real estate assets that aren't so great um, in a rising market. Don't necessarily need to do it right at the peak. Um, it's always good to leave a bit of money on the table for the person buying from you. Um, uh, but, you know, the good quality stuff, you know, 
property in central London, I don't think I ever will sell that. Uh, so that's kind of, for me, how I play it. Um, the, but I think the most important thing is there is at some point during the final two years of uh, the real estate cycle where you stop buying uh, and you start building cash positions. Um, and I think that's related to the point about refinancing property at the top of the market. If it's to build a cash position, that's not a bad thing as long as, you know, you're not at ri you're not sort of um, at risk of having to refinance during a financial crisis. You know, I, if you borrow for a, with a two year fixed rate or something while, you know, the, you know, the rates of interest come down during a financial crisis as governments seek to reflate the economy. Um, you might not be able to find a bank to lend to you. Uh, so, you know, you, you run those sorts of risks. But if you can, if you can, you know, you're not using too much leverage, you can ride out the downturn, you can, and, you know, your, the yield from your assets will more than cover uh, the, the cost of interest and repayments, uh, then actually that's quite a good play um, uh, to build a cash cash pile so you've quality assets to enable you to build cheaper assets uh, cheaper asset portfolio when things have come down one of the things that jumped out to me when i read both those questions akil um both for selling and refinancing was the timing i was just thinking to myself gee wouldn't it be good if, if you know if someone could give you that timing so that you could make those you know those judgment calls wouldn't that be you know you'd probably do yeah. very well if you had that at hand well, that's good. But, you know, but bear in mind, of course, if you're a property uh, owner, you can't sell property very quickly. So so you don't really want to be on the absolute day that the market peaks. And of course, you can't really tell in the property market because, um, you know, indices don't necessarily apply to your particular. You know, there's a general index which contains a basket of all sorts of property. So your location, it might things might be different. Um, uh, but also indices are published, you know, several weeks after the event. So you might have missed the peak if you were waiting out for it. No, good response. I'm pretty sure there was quite a few people actually thinking that. Um, another question here, Akil. Uh, this, again, for the 2026-27 timeframes, this is the, you know, the potential peak of the land market. Uh, when they... Uh, crash does occur around this time. Where does one place their hard-earned gains? Do they live it in the bank where banks could face uh, bail-ins or potentially go broke or buy government bonds, which means we may take a haircut as governments have by this stage accrued huge debts. Do we hold on to real estate as it goes south? Where does the smart money go? Well, Interesting. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot on that. I probably won't be able to answer it all, but um, I don't. I, and I don't know too much about bail-ins. I know, you know, obviously it happened in Cyprus and other European countries. Um, I don't, as far as I know, it's not happened in Australia or the UK or the US. Um, and I don't know if there is those policies um, for for those countries. Uh, in, I mean, you know, they they can print money in, in a way that eurozone countries can't, uh, and so maybe that's the option they go for um, to save the banking system. Um, and you know, most deposits are covered by deposit insurance, so you obviously want to be kind of following the limits of that. Should protect some of your assets. Um, haircuts on bonds, um, on sovereign bonds, I don't think that is the case on private sector bonds certainly has that you know that's a common response so if you're in if you're in you know the if you own the bonds of a sort of a, a, a strong country uh, like the us or australia or the uk i don't see that necessarily being an issue um I, I suppose implicit in that question was well the government might run out of money uh, so therefore um they can't pay back i mean i think this is quite an important point. So a monetary sovereign such as the government of Australia or the UK or the US can never run out of money uh, in its own currency. Um, it effectively creates that money when it spends. Uh, and so there will never be a situation where you default, an Australian government would default on a, uh, a bond denominated in Australian dollars. Uh, so you won't have that situation. It's different in the Eurozone, but again, the Eurozone is 
I think is starting to work out how to address some of these issues. It will, whether it will have learned those lessons in time um, by the next crisis, I don't know. Um, it sort of rather depends on how integrated the European economy becomes, uh, and both economically and politically uh, over the next few years. Um, sorry, that uh, there was another part to that question which I've missed. Um, so what do you do? Real estate assets going south. I mean, I've I've kind of made that point already. I don't necessarily think real estate goes down by the same amount if it's in a good location. If you've been speculating on real estate at the edge of, uh, I don't know, Darwin or or some small village in the Northern Territory. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold that. I would get out well before the peak. Uh, even though you might be experiencing high levels of capital growth in the run up to the peak because, you know, there's a lot of speculation going on. On the other hand, if you own a place in the centre of Sydney overlooking Darling Harbour or something, um, don't sell that. That's always going to be in demand um, and will always uh, give you good rents and strong rents and so on. So it rather depends. Um, if you do happen to miss the peak of the market and prices have come down, um, I mean, it depends on your financial situation and your holding period and all that sort of thing. But what a lot of uh, investors do um, is that they kind of hold on, hold on, hold on, and almost kind of hold on for a few years and then sell just when things are starting to turn up again. So if you have missed the peak, prices have come down and you can hold, just hold. Um, as long as it, you know, you're covering your costs, uh, your um, uh, your uh, You've got demand, you know, people are renting your place out and so on. So uh, I think I think, you know, there are different strategies depending on what you have. But don't overreact would be my would be my sort of suggestion. Um, other yeah. areas, so got some some elements of recovered gold, um, quality real estate. Um, you know, when things have come down, buying good quality stuff with all the cash you've built up is good and holding it for a while. That's kind of what smart money does when blood on the streets they're buying well where where does the smart money go that was part of the the end of that question yeah. in australia they have this government deposit insurance scheme so um now they do in, in the brief, uk and in the us yes so in brief the government guarantees on paper at least uh two hundred fifty thousand dollars per approved financial institute deposit so on paper, if you had 250000 and a bank went down, on theory, the government would step in and cover that for you. Uh, however, we've never seen it enacted, so we don't know whether that would stand the stress test of uh, you know, a real estate downfall that we uh, are expecting. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Well, that, I mean, that, those, those are in part to stop a bank run which then becomes self-fulfilling. So people withdraw all their savings from banks all at once and the bank will probably collapse. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling proxy. So this is our last question for tonight, Akil. Uh, it's quite straightforward, actually. Are there financial conditions that may support the current property cycle peaking later than 2026? Um. That's interesting. So I think there's a couple of things to say about that. The first is, um, you know, the US leads the world into and out of every real estate cycle, at least so far. Uh, and it's for the US that we're suggesting the peak will be around 2026. Um, and that being the case, other countries will be a bit behind the US. And so they may, you know, potentially go up a bit longer than 2026. Um, and that, you know, I think would particularly apply to commodity producing nations because commodities tend to peak after uh, the the real estate market. Um, at least historically, that's been the case. Or peak after the stock market, should we say? Um, and so, if commodities are still doing well in the months and years after twenty twenty six, you know that would be good for property, probably in certain parts of Australia, for example. So that, that's kind of a couple of scenarios. So everyone follows the US, US peaks in 2026. Um, commodities go up, so you might have in some markets further increase beyond 2026. The other scenario is not necessarily related to property, but in just in general, in terms of assets and other things. 
Um, and that is if the boom is so big, um, even though maybe the real estate market might peak in 2026, um, other assets go up a bit longer. Um, even though the real estate market might not be doing anything for the final sort of couple of years beyond the peak, you know, you might still have stock prices going up um, a, a bit longer. That's definitely a possibility. It's something that I've written about um, and will continue to watch carefully. And, and the reason that I'm kind of quite interested in this scenario is that's pretty much what happened in the 1920s. Um, and so we do often look for 100 year repeats in markets. Um, it's not a big cycle, but it is, you know, there is something to it historically. Um, and what you found during the 1920s was that the land market in the US peaked in 1926, at least for residential real estate. Um, uh, but because interest rates were actually lowered in, I think it was in 1925, um, to enable the UK to return to the gold standard, which was a really catastrophic mistake, um, the US uh, lowered interest rates and that really ignited a very strong couple of years in the US stock market. So the Dow Jones didn't peak until 1929. So almost three years after the real estate market had peaked. Uh, and even though banks were starting to look quite ropey in the late 1920s, you know, such was the boom and such was the frenzy in investment uh, in stocks. Uh, and actually, just to go back to something else I've said, um, partly because a lot of new investors in the stock market uh, in the 1920s. Um, so such was the investment frenzy that the stocks really accelerated in 27 and 28. Uh, and you could see that possibility again. You could, you know, you could see property prices peaking in 1926, um, but things going on a bit longer. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, in Polly, it could be there's a lot of uh, new investors. It could be that we've we've not really we don't really understand the dynamics of China of the size that it is now as part of the real estate cycle. Um, that's an unknown. I mean, we assume that it will start to follow the boom and bust cycle in the same way that the US and other economies that have come into the global economy like Japan have. But, you know, that's still a variable that we don't have a specific or a unknown that we don't have a specific answer for. Um, maybe government interventions are so strong in the aftermath of a crisis that the market can shrug off any problems in the real estate market for a couple of years. It won't be able to do it indefinitely. Uh, but that's a possibility that we have to look at. Um, and then another cycle that we look at is commodity cycles, Kondratiev waves. Uh, and you often find that towards the peak of those cycles, which is also coming up in the 2020s, um, there's increasing competition between the great powers. Uh, so the US and China, and we're obviously seeing signs of that already. And that can, at least for a time, be very bullish for markets. So so these are sort of some of the things that might lead to the cycle peaking, at least on, at least from outward appearances, peaking later uh, than we forecast. Um, it's hard to say now if that will happen or not, but it, we're certainly alive to that possibility. A good summation um, of, I think, the kill of all the drivers that, um, you know, probably share market economics will be watching very closely as we approach that, that peak, um, particularly once the US land market shows those signs that it has peaked as well. And it just watches everything falls into place. We are done here now. That's the last question for tonight. Um, no, good question. I just want to, um, yeah, no, that was it. Yeah. No, I said there were, there were good it. questions. It was uh, very it was good, good questions. Yeah, yeah very good questions. Um, hopefully we've answered them to your um, satisfaction, everyone who's watching. I'd like to say... Thank you for sending them in um, on the nine and thank you for attending the, the Boom Bus Bulletin webinar. Uh, on behalf of myself, everyone, extend thanks to Akil for taking the time out tonight to um, film this Q&A session uh, for us. Uh, we'll send you out an email when this uh, email is published and uh, we'll embed a link in there as well so you can find it. So on behalf of myself, Akil, and the Property Share Market Economic Team, uh, thank you very much for your time and good night.